G'day guys, welcome to this installment of my Chaos Space Marines Masterclass. I'm Alpharius. I'm Dean from Blog for the Blood God, and today we're going to be talking about the Alpha Legion. We're going to be breaking down all of their Warlord traits, stratagems and relics, some of the different combos that you can do with them, and we're also going to be talking about their very unique secondary objective, and whether or not it's good or bad. So we'll work that out together and we'll have a conversation at the end. And then we're also going to be breaking down a couple of different list ideas for what you could do with the Alpha Legion if you wanted to take them to a competitive tournament. So with that being said, let's get straight into the video. Alrighty, let's kick off by talking about the Alpha Legion Legion trait. So each time a ranged attack targets a unit with this trait, if the attacker is more than 12 inches away, you subtract one from that attack's hit roll. If this unit contains models with a wounds characteristic of 10 or more, the attacker must be more than 18 inches away instead for these benefits to apply. Units with this trait are eligible to perform an action or declare a charge in a turn in which they fell back. If a unit with this trait declares a charge whilst it's performing an action, the action is still failed. All right, so straight out the gate, I actually think this is low-key one of the stronger Legion traits because the ability to fall back and charge is one of those things that's going to give you a lot of utility. And in pr a lot of armies don't really leverage this because they don't have the durable units. So durable units are key for this to be useful because you want to be able to take a charge, survive, and then you want to be able to fall back and charge something else or even fall back and then charge back into that same combat. So now you're the charger and therefore you get to fight first. So there's a lot of utility with this. You can even fall back with one unit and then charge in with another so they can swap out. And the one that just fell back is going to be able to do an action if they're an Alpha Legion unit. So this is actually really powerful, the interplay with being able to fall back and do actions and fall back and charge. It's a really important tech piece that's gonna really tie into the overall theme of Alpha Legion, which is that they have a lot of tech pieces. They've got a lot of tricky things that they can do. They don't bring a lot of raw power, but what they lack in power, they more than make up for in tricks. And this is just one example, and it's army-wide. It's fantastic. Then on top of that, you also get a neg one to hit buff if you're outside of 12 inches. So with this, I think Alpha Legion are gonna to try to lean more heavily into infantry units with those wounds characteristics below 10. Um, I don't think you're going to be wanting to put in anything that's going to be in that high wound bracket because then your opponent can get around you a bit better. And the good thing about this is this means if you're versing something like Tau or something like that and they want to dodge that neg one to hit um, ability, they're going to have to come close to you. And that's where Chaos Space Marines want their enemy. They want them close. So the Alpha Legion is really good at pulling people in close, hitting them, and then falling back and hitting other things whilst doing all of the actions. This is gonna be a really powerful army if you can master this Legion trait. All right, next up, we have their unique secondary objective for Alpha Legion. Now, this one's quite wordy and it's a little bit confusing. So let's go through it together and then I'm gonna show you some of the deployment maps and how to apply this specifically. So let's go through that together now. So it's in Shadow Operations. If you select this objective, Alpha Legion infantry units from your army can perform the following action. One Alpha Legion infantry unit excluding a character from your army can perform this action at the end of your movement phase if it's wholly within six inches of your opponent's deployment zone. The action is completed at the end of your next command phase provided the unit attempting is still wholly within six inches of your opponent's deployment zone. If completed, if the unit that performed the action is within range of an objective marker, roll 1d6 to see if that objective marker has been subverted. If the unit contains a cultist unit, the objective marker is subverted on a 5+, plus. otherwise that objective marker is subverted on a 3+. Plus. Enemy units can never control objective markers that have been subverted, and they can never perform actions while they are in range of any objective markers that have been subverted. Each time a unit from your army completes this action, score 3 victory points. Score 4 victory points instead if that unit completed the action whilst wholly within your opponent's deployment zone. So there's a lot going on there. Basically, you're going to be doing actions if you're within six inches of your opponent's deployment zone, but you have to be wholly within, so your unit has to be all the way in, right? And each time you do that action, if the unit survives till the next turn, you get three victory points. Further to that, if you're wholly in their deployment zone, you get four victory points. And further to that, if you're simultaneously within range of an objective marker, 
your opponent can never hold that objective marker again, which is fucking crazy, right? So the idea here is it's a very difficult objective to score because you have to be all the way up in your opponent's face, which means it's gonna be hard to score early and risky to score later. You also have to survive for the entire turn. So you have to get there and still be there in the subsequent turn. That's challenging to do, right? So there's a few challenging limits on this. However, if you're able to score it in your opponent's deployment zone, it's worth four victory points. So it's a relatively high scoring uh, secondary objective. Further to that, it also means if you, if you happen to be holding an objective when you do it, which a few of the maps have several options here, you're gonna make it so your opponent can never hold that, which is so powerful if you're able to pull it off. Because now if you're playing on a five objective map, and you're able to turn one of them off for your opponent, but you can still control it, well now your opponent has no incentive to take that objective from you because they can't control it. So you can sort of turn off one area of the table and force the fight to happen somewhere else. And what you do is that somewhere else is where you put your big chaos terminator brick. So now your opponent's like, well, I have to go and fight this terminator brick now because if he's turned off this objective and he's controlling that one with terminators and that one's in his backfield, your opponent can't just let that happen because then they'd be giving up primary. And primary is one of the ways that you can really skyrocket your score because you can get 12 points in a single turn, whereas most secondaries you cap three in a single turn. So working out how to master this could potentially make Alpha Legion players, when they've mastered it, really dangerous on the tabletop because if you go up against them and you can't stop them from getting that subversion, you're in a lot of trouble and you're gonna be pushing shit uphill to try to win that game. So let's go through a few of the deployment maps now and we'll talk about how you can go about achieving this secondary objective. And then once we've done that, we'll go through all the relics and the combos and the lists. Okay, so both of the missions where you have table quarter deployment, right? Where you're deploying nine inches from the center. You're uh, actually able to hold that central objective whilst being wholly within six inches of your opponent's deployment zone. So as you can see, I've outlined in green the six inches from their deployment zone, and then I've got the two blue circles are subvertible objectives. So because an objective marker is 40 mils and it sits directly in the center, and then you can control it if you're within three inches of it, well, three plus nine plus half of 40 mils is more than nine. Uh, so, sorry, three plus six plus the 40 mils is half nine. So basically you can be just toe in on that objective marker whilst still being wholly within your opponent's deployment zone. Now this one in particular is really easy to achieve because Alpha Legion also have a pre-game move. So you can take a big unit of something really strong and you can pre-game move it up into the center, then you can move it onto that central objective but on the other side of the central objective. And now you're going to be controlling that with a big tough unit, turn one, and you're gonna be able to subvert the middle. Now subverting that middle objective is going to be crazy because now your opponent has to try to take your backfield and Alpha Legion are exceptionally good at defending their backfield due to that neg one to hit outside of range. So that's really good. And then also obviously there's the objective marker in the center of their deployment zone that you're able to subvert as well. All right, the next one we'll look at is secure missing artifacts. For this one, there is also two objective markers that you are able to subvert. So one of them is just outside of their deployment zone, but you can be within that objective marker whilst simultaneously wholly within six inches of their deployment zone. And then the other one is smack bang in their deployment zone. This one is still very good. You can still subvert two objective markers, which is really powerful. And this one in particular, there's quite a large deployment zone. So it's quite easy to get your units into their deployment zone and do the subversion action. So even if you can't get onto the objective, it's pretty easy to get in their deployment zone for that sweet four victory points. Now, for this one, it's not quite as good as the table quarters because it's kind of challenging to get a unit onto those objectives first turn. So you can do it, but it can be a bit tricky. So I think Alpha Legion are gonna pivot hard into things like Raptors and Warp Talons because they're fast units. They're gonna be able to get out there early, particularly Warp Talons because they have an ability to make it so that your opponent can't fall back after they charge. So you could like, use your pre-game moves. There's a lot of stuff you can do. So we'll go through all that later, but just know that with these ones, it's still very strong because there's two that you can subvert and there's ways that you can get on there. All right, next up we have Tide of Conviction. Now this is one of the six objective marker missions and this one actually has three subvertible objectives. So this is actually really, really strong. 
those subvertible objectives will be 18 inches away from your deployment zone. So being able to get on them turn one can be challenging. However, it is very, very good. All right, so this is one of the really strong ones for the Alpha Legion. They're gonna be able to subvert multiple objective markers here and they're objective markers that your opponent is probably gonna be relying on being able to control. So if you're able to get there, you can start the subversion action and then your opponent has to kill that unit. They just have to. They gotta put all of their effort into killing it because if they don't and you're able to flip that objective and they can no longer control it, then they're gonna have a really hard time. So even though this is six objectives, so if you flip only one of them, it's easier for your opponent to go, cool, I'll just focus on the other five. The positioning of the objectives that you are able to flip is going to really help you control the tempo of the game and you can control where the fight is going to be taking place. So this is a very interesting mission. All right, next up we have the scouring. Now for this one, I'm not 100% sure if I like it. It's good in that it has two objectives that are able to be subverted and it's good in the way that it's not too difficult to get into that area of the table. However, the challenge here is that all of those objectives are clustered together in the center of the objective and none of the objectives are in your opponent's deployment zone. So this means your subversion actions are gonna be a little bit trickier. That being said, it's quite deep deployment. So even if you're not able to subvert the objective markers, you are going to be able to get into their deployment zone and just do a subvert action and get your four victory points. Cause it's worth noting, you don't have to do it on objectives. It's just, if you happen to do it on an objective, it's even better. All right, next up we have the mission that the Alpha Legion definitely do not want to see. They do not want to come up against their opponents on this one. It's called Abandoned Sanctuaries. So Alpha Legion definitely don't want to see this one because there's only a single objective marker that you're able to subvert. And also being Dawn of War, their deployment zone is quite thin and it's quite easy for your opponent to stop you from getting into that deployment zone to do your subvert action. All right, next up we have Data Scry Salvage. Now this is another one that the Alpha Legion are just like, yuck, get it away. Because they only have a single objective marker that they're able to subvert. So as you can see, there's only the central objective in your opponent's deployment zone is the only option for subversion. That being said, there is quite a large deployment zone with these angled kind of deployments. So it's gonna be quite easy for you to get into their, object, their deployment zone and do your subvert action. It's just gonna be difficult for you to survive there. All right, next up we have tear down their icons. So in this one, there's two again, and they are relatively easy to get. This is another five objective one. So very similar situation to some of the uh, objectives we've seen of some of the missions that we've seen so far. All right, now we have recover the relics. Now this is another one that's gonna be quite good for the Alpha Legion because there are three objective markers that you're going to be able to subvert. As you can see, there's the two that are outside of their deployment zone, but are within six. So you'll be able to, to subvert them with your units. And then there's also the one deep in their deployment zone. It's also worth noting that on Recover the Relics, you've got quite a deep deployment zone. So it's gonna be quite easy for you to get your units into that deployment zone and subvert their deployment. All right, so the question that we're all asking now is, is this secondary objective even any good? Was it worth going through all of that? And I actually think the jury is still out on that one. So I think it's a very hard secondary objective, right? So for the most for the most people, it's gonna be relatively inaccessible and it's going to be bad. However, I think if you, if you put the tools in your list specifically designed to do this and you pair it with other things, like for example, behind enemy lines pairs quite well with this because you wanna be in your opponent's deployment zone, right? So if you pair those sorts of things together and you develop a game plan that's around popping holes so that you can jump in, so that you can subvert, so that you can survive, so that you can behind enemy lines. Like if you build your list designing it to do these things, then it actually can be absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and it all depends on whether or not you're able to actually execute that plan. If you can come up with a plan, work it out, master it, then it's possibly one of those things where it's like nunchucks, right? Like if somebody who doesn't know what they're doing gets nunchucks, they're gonna hit themselves in the face and they're gonna fuck themselves up, right? But if somebody masters the nunchucks, you're like, that weapon's actually fucking savage, right? I think that's where the Alpha Legion are gonna fall when it comes in terms of their secondary. It's like, it's gonna be one of those things where you give it to the average person and they're gonna hit themselves in the nuts, you know? But if you keep at it and you keep practicing it, you'll end up being a fucking ninja. So, <laughs> so uh, I think it's perfectly fitting for the Alpha Legion to have such a, a nuanced and tricky objective. But I think for the average player, this is gonna be something that you're probably gonna be better off avoiding. 
If I was running Alpha Legion, I would take this out of protest. I would just always be like, no, I'm taking my Alpha Legion secondary and I'm just gonna brute force it. I'm just gonna keep doing it until I figure it out. And I'm just gonna master it because realistically, if you're playing Alpha Legion, chances are you're playing them because you enjoy that tricky, sneaky stuff. So I think you're gonna, you're gonna struggle to achieve it, but those times that you do achieve it are gonna be so satisfying that you're gonna love it. So that's my sort of general take on this secondary objective. And uh, yeah, let's get into the Wall of Traits relics and stratagems. All right, so the first Warlord trait that the Alpha Legion have access to is called I Am Alpharius. So after nominating a model to be your Warlord, randomly determine one additional Warlord trait for them, re-rolling duplicate results from a Warlord traits table of your choice that the model has access to. Then, if this model is de destroyed, you can immediately select one other Alpha Legion's character model from your army that does not have a Warlord trait and select a Warlord trait for that model to gain. This must be a Warlord trait that no other model from your army has, it must be one that a model can have, and it cannot be I Am Alpharius. Until the end of the battle, that model counts as your Warlord for all rules purposes. If any mission objective, secondary objective, or agenda rules are triggered when a Warlord is destroyed, those rules are not triggered until this new Warlord is destroyed. All right, so this one's interesting. So basically what it means is you randomly determine your first Warlord trait, but then every time he dies, somebody else gets to just pick one. And then he dies and somebody else gets to just pick one. It's, it's cute, I think it's fun, but there's no way that I would be spending one of my precious pre-game command points for a random Warlord trait, knowing that the benefit I get is that if he dies, I then get to select one from somebody else. I would rather just select one for somebody else. So I don't think this is particularly useful. All right, next up we have clandestine, and this one I do think is quite useful. So each time an attack is made against this warlord, an unmodified hit roll of one, two, or a three for the attack fails, irrespective of any abilities that the weapon or model making the attack may have. And each time an attack is allocated to this warlord, whilst it is receiving the benefits of cover, add an additional one to any armor saving throws made against the attack. All right, so straight out the gate, not be, trans hitman, not being able to be hit on a one, two, or three is very, very powerful. And then if you stack that with the fact that they're gonna get an additional plus one if they're receiving the benefits of cover. Now it's worth noting that this doesn't say light cover. So if you're receiving the benefits of dense cover, you would also gain the plus one save. So what you can do is you can stack this with relics like Gorget of Hate, which gives you a further plus one. So now you can have like a Demon Prince, for example, with a two up save and if he's in dense cover, he's gonna be receiving a further plus one to that. So he's gonna have a one up save with armor of contempt for effectively a zero up save, which means AP two weapons, you're still getting a two up save against it with your demon prince. And they can't hit him on a one, two or a three. So, and they're gonna be neg one to hit as well if they're outside of that 12 inches range. So if there's something like Tau that are already hitting on fours, well, suck it, you're now hitting on fives. So, and there's dense cover as well. So even if you mark a light him, you're still hitting him on fives. So it's really powerful into the anti-tower matchup. It's also just a generally well-rounded good warlord trait. All right, next up we have headhunter. If you want to make your warlord into a bit of a sniper, a bit of an assassin. So each time you're, you select a target for an attack made with a ranged weapon by this warlord, if that weapon is rapid fire or a pistol weapon, you can ignore the lookout serve rule. You can reroll the attack's wound roll and an unmodified roll of six. Wound roll of six, the target suffers one mortal wound in addition to normal damage. This is cool, but let's be honest, if your characters are trying to kill other characters, chances are they're doing it with things like axes, swords, maces, that sort of shit. They're not doing it with their fucking bolt pistol. All right, now we get into the real juicy stuff. This Warlord trait is one of the best in the Chaos Space Ring Codex, in my opinion. This is so immensely powerful. Master of Diversion. So after both sides have deployed and resolved pre-battle ability step of the mission you are playing, you can select up to three Alpha Legion units from your army that are wholly within your deployment zone. Remove those units from the battlefield, then set them up anywhere on the battlefield that is wholly within your deployment zone and more than nine inches from enemy models. If the mission uses strategic reserves rules, any of those units can be placed into strategic reserves without having to spend any additional command points, regardless of how many units are already in strategic reserves. This is fucking huge. So first of all, it's essentially just a redeploy on multiple units, right? 
But being able to redeploy those units into strategic reserves gives you an amazingly powerful tactical advantage. So Emperor's Children used to be able to do this for one CP per unit. You're gonna be able to spend one CP now to do it to multiple units, which is really powerful. And what you can do is you can actually bait your opponent during deployment. So you can deploy your Terminators front and center hyper aggressive, and then your opponent's gonna go, oh no, I have to hide, right? Or I can draw a line of sight on it. So they deploy all their stuff out in the open because they can see your Terminators. Right? And then you just go, cool, master of diversions. I'm just going to put him, put them behind this ruin here, put them, you know, in back in strat reserves, whatever. And you know, you do this also after you know who's going first. So basically you can deploy aggressively. And then if you get first turn, in you go. Whereas if your opponent gets first turn, you can go conservative. So it essentially guarantees that you're going to be able to deploy perfectly for the mission. And also the other thing that this does, which is truly underestimated, is it just insulates you from mistakes. So sometimes you'll just make a mistake during deployment. You'll be like, oh, I can't believe I didn't screen out my backfield. I forgot he had a drop pod, you know? And that's game over, you know? Because you, you'll be deploying and you'll be like, oh shit, I didn't, you know? Whereas now you can be like, cool, I've just protected myself from mistakes. Because if I make a mistake during deployment, I can actually just fix it after they've deployed their army. Huge, you know? Or if you deploy something and you didn't realize, oh, hang on, you can pregame move with your rhino and then disembark your repenture and then charge. I didn't realize, well, actually, cool. I'm just going to redeploy one of my cultist units in front and create a line. And now those repent have to charge cultists instead of my terminator brick that I was worried that you were going to kill. So there's tons of utility with this. And also it's worth noting that this means it doesn't matter how many units you already have in strategic reserves, you can add more using this. So you can effectively null deploy by going cool. Let's hypothetically say you've got three units of terminators that are 333 points each, right? You put all three of those in strat reserves, so that's a thousand points in strat reserves, more or less. And then on the table, you have three similar big units of something, right? You could go, cool, I'm going to use my Master of Diversions and I'm going to yeet them into strat reserves as well. And now I've got nothing on the table and then you can just come down wherever you want. Now, often I would not advise doing this because it means you can't come down turn one, which means that your opponent's got two movement phases if they go first to just screen out the whole board. So it's not something that I would advise doing, but it's worth knowing that you can do it. So you can sort of, in some situations, you might want to partially do this. You know, you might want to go, cool, I'm actually going to null deploy a lot. So I'm just going to deploy the Terminator brick with all my characters in it. That's all I'm going to actually deploy and everything else. I'm going to use Master of Diversions and Strategic Reserves to get it all off the table. So now my opponent only has a single target. And then you take something like grind them down where all you have to do is kill one thing. They're not going to kill your thing. So you get multiple turns of grind them down whilst you're just dropping in one unit a turn, doing massive damage with it. And then they kill one unit and then you can cycle that back and forth. So there's a few different ways that you can use this, but I think this Warlord trait gives you so much utility, so much flexibility, so many options that it's just amazingly powerful. All right, next up, we have a Warlord trait that buffs your cultists. So cult leader, in your command phase, you can select one friendly Alpha Legion cultist unit within nine inches of the Warlord. Until the start of your next command phase, add one to the attack's hit roll. Improve the armor penetration characteristic of the attack by one. This is lame. Who cares about cultists? You're not taking cultists to do damage. The cultists are there to do actions and screen out and those sorts of things. They're a great utility piece and I love cultists. I think they're one of the most underrated units in the whole codex. However, you're not taking them for the purposes of having high strength and AP and those things. Yeah. All right, next up we have Covert Control. In your command phase, you can select one friendly Alpha Legion core unit that's within six inches of your Warlord. Until the start of your next command phase, the unit can shoot whilst performing an action and the unit has objective secured ability. If the unit already had this ability, that model counts as one additional model for determining who controls an objective marker. All right, so this is another one of the Warlord traits that I think Alpha Legion are gonna automatically take because making that big brick of Chaos Terminators that are in almost every Chaos list right now, making that unit objective secured and be able to move up into the table, shoot all their Storm Bolters while still doing actions is really powerful. So this Warlord trait is fucking gangster. So I think most people are gonna be spending two CP minimum pre-game and they're gonna be taking the, the redeploy one and the objective secured one. All right, so we had some pretty spicy Warlord traits in there. Let's talk about Relics. Now, the Relics for the Alpha Legion are a bit iffy, so let's go through them together. 
First, we have Blade of the Hydra. This is a traitorous version of Teeth of Terror. Let's have a look. So Alpha Legion model with an Astartes Chainsword only. The relic replaces the Astartes Chainsword and has the following profile. Blade of Hydra, it's a melee weapon, plus one strength, neg two, one damage, and each time the bearer fights, it makes D3 plus three additional attacks with this weapon. If there are six or more enemy models within three inches of the bearer when the model is selected to fight, it makes six additional attacks with this weapon instead. All right, so giving this to something like a Chaos Lord where he's got a chainsword and he goes in with six extra attacks, so he's hitting you with 12 attacks is pretty good. And then if you put Flames of Spite on him, so he's getting reroll wounds on all of those and sixes to wound do mortals, he actually becomes a bit of a blender. However, I think that there's better options for characters if your goal is to be doing damage than taking a guy with a chainsword. So unfortunately, I don't think this one's gonna fly, but it's still an interesting one and I could see people getting some fun using this. All right, next we have the Drake Scale Plate. Alpha Legion infantry model only. The bearer has a save characteristic of two plus, and each time an attack is made against the bearer, an unmodified wound roll of one, two, or three always fails, irrespective of any abilities the weapon or the model making the attack may have. All right, so this one's really interesting. If it wasn't locked to infantry only, it would be insane because you'd be able to take it on things like Demon Princes and Lord Discordants. However, being locked to infantry, I think it's a little bit less valuable. It is really cool on something like a Master of Executions though, and you can stack it with the clandestine trait. So you'll be giving him a two plus armor save from this, and then the Warlord trait for clandestine, giving him further plus one if he's receiving the benefit of cover. So you could take that Master of Executions and put him in cover, and he's gonna be getting a zero up save, which is really powerful. And with Armor of Contempt as well, really, really powerful. And then you can just send him in and he's gonna be really hard to kill in shooting because he's got trans hitman, trans fucking uh, human, and a negative one up save. No one's shooting, no one's killing that in shooting. And he's also gonna be neg one to hit if your opponent's further than 12 inches away. And he's a character, so he's hard to hit. Like you can make a master of executions that doesn't give a fuck. He's just like, nah, you can't kill me. And master of executions goes in and does a fair bit of damage in combat. So there's a really interesting play there. Uh, that being said, I don't necessarily think that it's worth investing all of those CP into a character that's that slow and then having to hug terrain in order to get the utility out of him. I, I don't know. Let me know if you guys think this is uh, a valuable one. I think this is just on the cusp of competitive. All right, next we have the Hydra's Whale. And this one is very much an Alpha Legion strat. So this ties into what I was saying earlier about how Alpha Legion just have tricks for days. So let's have a look at this one. Once per battle, after your opponent uses a stratagem, excluding the command reroll, the bearer can use this relic. If it does so until the end of the battle, the CP cost your opponent must pay to use that stratagem again is increased by one. Now, in the old Knackmond environment, that was really powerful. But I think in this sort of situation, you're gonna have to spend a CP in order to gain this. They then have to spend a CP on a stratagem. You then use your ability it doesn't impact that first use of the stratagem. It's just if they're gonna use that same stratagem again later. And I think a lot of armies aren't really taking like the old veterans of the long war for one CP and just using it, you know, two, three times a turn. So I think it's one of those things where it's like, it, it, it sounds good, but I think we're falling back on historical ideas there. And I think in the current scenario, the current situation that we find ourselves in with Nephilim, I think this is gonna be less useful than we might initially have thought. Next, we have the Viper's Bite. It's a super bolt pistol. Alpha Legion model with a bolt pistol only. This relic replaces the bolt pistol and has the following profiles. 18 inch range, pistol six, strength four, AP three, one damage. All right, so it's a six shooter. It's got 18 inches range. It's got high AP, so it's got a lot of buffs. It's a lot better than a bolt pistol, but it's still a bolt pistol, you know? like. Being the world's best bolt pistol doesn't mean you're good. It still means you're just a bolt pistol. So I wouldn't be looking into this. I think it's kind of irrelevant. That being said, it's interesting if you want to also double down and spend the extra CP to make it so that you can target characters because then you could, you know, come in from deep strike reserves or something like that. Pistols, you know, I don't know, yuck. Alrighty, we have another upgraded bolt weapon. The Hydra's Teeth, uh, Alpha Legion model with a bolt weapon only. When you give this model a relic, select one bolt weapon that the bearer has uh, is equipped with. That weapon is considered a relic for all rules purposes. Each time the bearer is selected to shoot, you can choose for that weapon to fire Hydra's teeth bolt. If you do so, 
the bearer can only make one attack with that weapon, but the following rules apply. That attack automatically hits the target, add two to the strength and damage characteristics of that attack, and improve the armor penetration characteristic of that attack by two, and invulnerable saving throws cannot be made against that attack. All right, so as far as upgraded bolt weapons go, this is pretty good. It's better than the pistol from before because this one's giving you extra damage and all these you know, automatically hits and extra strength and a lot of stuff like that. That being said, I still fall back on my, it's an upgraded bolt gun. You know, your Chaos Lord isn't famous for his bolt gun. So I think this is another one that if you're playing a fun, silly game, you might take it, but and you might take it with the sniper ability so that you can tar target your enemy characters, but I just don't think this is valuable. Next, we have the Icon of the Hydra Cult. Alpha Legion model only. This relic can be given to a cultist model. The bearer has the following ability, Icon of the Hydra Cult. While a friendly Alpha Legion cultist unit is within six inches of the bearer, each time a ranged attack targets that unit. If the attacker is more than 12 inches away, the target is treated as having the benefits of dense cover against the attack. Okay, so more or less what this is going to do is it's going to give your cultists the same Alpha Legion Legion trait. Right, it's going to give you a, a proxy of that. All right, next up we have the Mind Veil. Alpha Legion infantry model only. Each time the bearer makes a normal move, advances, falls back until the end of the phase, add one d6 to the bearer's move characteristic. Each time the bearer makes a normal move, advances, falls back, or makes a charge move until the end of until that move is finished, it can move horizontally through models and terrain features. It cannot finish the move on top of another model or its base. So for all of those who are raging that there's no jump pack lords, no jump pack sorcerers anymore, this is actually an interesting way to more or less get one because it allows you to get that extra d6 to your move characteristic, it allows you to move over enemy models, and it allows you to essentially, if you put an advance in there as well, you're kind of functioning similar to a jump pack. That being said, I don't think it's particularly valuable and I genuinely don't really feel that there's a need for this. And also, the jump pack that we're looking for used to let you deep strike. That was the main value you got out of putting jump packs on your characters. So, nah. All right, so as you can see, there was nothing really particularly standout-ish in those relics. So I think the Alpha Legion players are gonna fall back on the generic Chaos Space Marine relics because there are quite a few good ones in there. Um, but you're not gonna be spending your command points on these because Alpha Legion in particular, above all, have some of the best stratagems in the Chaos Space Marine arsenal. So you're gonna be wanting to save a bunch of your command points so that you can do crazy things with them during the game. So I think realistically for you people who wanna play Alpha Legion competitively, you're probably just gonna take the redeploy and the objective secured warlord trait. You might take a single relic, but probably even not you might leave that behind so that you have plenty of CP to use these following stratagems. All right, so first up we have Conceal. So it's a strategic ploy, costs two to three CP. Use this stratagem at the start of your opponent's shooting phase. Select one Alpha Legion infantry unit from your army. Until the end of the phase, each time an enemy model shoots, if that unit is not the clo closest eligible target or within 12 inches of that model, then that shooting is resolved. That model cannot target this unit. If the unit has a power rating of 10 or more, it costs three CP, otherwise it costs two CP. All right, so concealing a unit is quite expensive. It's a two or three CP. So it's something, like I said, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you save a lot of your pregame CP so that you can do this when you need to. But when you do it, it's immensely powerful. You can have a unit of cultists holding in a backfield objective and knowing that in your opponent's turn, they're gonna make moves, be like, yes, cool, I'll move my anti-infantry stuff over here or shoot him off that objective. And then he's gonna get a four point primary instead of an eight. And then in their movement phase, in their shooting phase, you just go, bop, two CP, you can't shoot those cultists. And now you've just secured yourself victory points. You've also forced them to position their units in a vulnerable spot because they were chasing that kill. And you've also kept your cultists alive, so they're able to raise banners, they're able to do, you know, do all kinds of other things throughout, throughout the game. So continue to screen out your backfield, that sort of stuff. You can also use it on more vulnerable units. So you might use, for example, Chosen. You might go, cool, I'm gonna fly the Raptors up, I'm gonna fly this up, and then I'm gonna walk my Chosen up into the open. And then when my opponent goes to target the Chosen, you're just like, nope, can't target them. And that way you're able to keep your Chosen alive for longer and actually get them into the combats that they want to. So really powerful strat there as well. 
Alrighty, Alpha Legion are all about laying those traps and setting deadly ambushes. Use this stratagem at the end of your reinforcement step of your opponent's movement phase. Select one enemy unit that was set up on the battlefield as reinforcements this phase. Until the end of your next turn, each time an Alpha Legion model from your army makes an attack against that unit, add one to that attack's hit roll for two command points. So this one sounds really expensive. Two command points for plus one to hit. Ugh. However, it's worth noting that this is for your entire army for an entire turn. So realistically, if somebody drops their Sanguinary Guard, you can go, cool, two CP, and then in your next turn, because they're gonna be there and you're gonna need to kill them, right? The chances of you killing them in the turn that they dropped, so they drop in their turn, the chances of you killing them in their turn is quite low, right? Because they're gonna charge something and blend it, and then you're gonna have these Sand Guards sitting there being a prick that you need to deal with, right? Spending two CP to get army-wide plus one to hit in the shooting phase, and then if they're still alive, you can charge them and get plus one to hit against them in combat as well. That's actually really powerful because what that effectively does is that means you're gonna have to dedicate less resources into killing them. You could go, normally I'd have to throw my obliterators and my warp talons and a character in just to shred this unit of sanguinary guard. But now you can be like, well, actually, I'll just throw the obliterators in. And with the plus one to hit in shooting and in melee, they're gonna punch the fuck out of those sand guard. So that allows your warp talons and your you know, character to go off and do other things. So this is a bit of a, uh, a, um, a multiplier, a force multiplier, if you will, because it, affects multi because it affects your whole army across multiple phases. This also means that you can combine a lot of small arms to kill that unit because previously, because other things like, for example, Veterans of the Long War is also two CP and it also gives you plus one to wound, so, but that's for one phase for one unit. Whereas this is for the entire turn for multiple units. So you could go, cool, these three or four units of Legionnaires or, you know, whatever, are going to shoot it, charge it, and they'll actually do a lot of damage because all of them are receiving the benefits of this stratagem. All right, the next stratagem is called Coils of Deception. Use this stratagem in your movement phase when an Alpha Legion's core unit from your army falls back. That unit is still eligible to shoot this turn even though it fell back. All right, so this one is one of the ones that, that I see Alpha Legion players are going to be using a lot. It's only one CP, so it's one of their cheapest stratagems. It allows them to shoot when they fall back. And note that they can also charge when they fall back. They can also do actions when they fall back. And they can do, they have a Warlord trait that allows them to do actions and shoot. All right, so this effectively is going to turn your Alpha Legion into mini Death Watch units because you're going to be able to fall back, you're going to be able to charge and shoot. So you're gonna be able to do a lot of different things with a single unit. So this is really powerful and it really helps circumvent one of the weaknesses of the Chaos Space Marines in that a lot of Chaos Space Marine lists are building around big units, like a big unit of Terminators with characters inside, you know, big units of various things all over the table. So being able to just go, okay, cool, you've tagged me, I don't care because I'm gonna in my turn fall back, shoot the thing that just tagged me dead and then charge something else. It really just allows you to run through your opponent's army. All right, now we have my favorite stratagem that the Alpha Legion have access to. It's called Forward Operatives, and it's very, very powerful. So use this stratagem for one CP in the Resolve Pre-Battle Abilities step of the mission you're playing. Select one Alpha Legion infantry unit from your army. That unit can make a normal move as if it were your movement phase, but it must end that move more than nine inches away from enemy models. You can only use this stratagem once unless you are playing a strike force or onslaught battle, in which case you can use it twice. Each Alpha Legion infantry unit can only be selected for this stratagem once. All right, so what I think a lot of people are gonna be doing with this is they're gonna be taking units like Warp Talons or Raptors that are infantry units that have large move characteristics. And you're going to be using the redeploy to basically wait for your opponent once they've all set up their army, you're gonna be like, cool, do I go first? Yes, okay, I'm gonna redeploy my warp talons so that they're directly across from whatever their intended target is. I'm then gonna use forward operatives to move it up nine inches. Then we're gonna go into my turn one and I'm going to be going forward another 12 inches. So I'm gonna be moving 21 inches down the table, which is puts me right in front of your deployment zone. And then I'm gonna be charging you with a big unit of warp talons. Really powerful combo. So being able to redeploy and pregame move is very, very powerful. All right, the next strategy we're talking about is Renaissance Infiltration. 
To 1 CP, use the stratagem in your movement phase when an Alpha Legion unit from your army that is more than 6 inches away from an enemy model is selected to move. If the mission you're playing uses the Strategic Reserves rule, place that unit into Strategic Reserves. That unit cannot arrive from Strategic Reserves in the same turn as it was placed into Strategic Reserves. Alright, so this is going to be really good in the way that if you realize that you've, you've over-invested on one side of the table and you want to send models across to the other side, but they're slow, they might be things like Terminators or Cultists or Legionnaires or Chosen that are slow and you're like, they're just never going to get there. You can go, cool, I'm just going to spend a CP to put them in Strat Reserves and then next turn, drop them down over there. That's really powerful. And it also pairs well with units that don't natively have that ability to go into Strat Reserves. So you could go, okay, cool, instead of spending one CP for my Cultists to go into Strat Reserves, I'm going to put them on the table, I'm going to raise a banner turn one, then I'm going to put them in strat reserves, and then I'm going to send them down in later turns of the game. So really powerful. It's also worth noting that if a unit starts on the table, you can bring them back into strat, from strat reserves in turns four and five. Whereas if you start them in strat reserves and they never touch the table, you then have to bring them in by the end of turn three. All right, next up we have Veiled Agenda. Use this stratagem after selecting secondary objectives or agendas. If your army contains any units with the Alpha Legion keyword, do not reveal one of your selections to your opponent. The first time you score victory points or experience points for that secondary objective or agenda, reveal it to your opponent. Note that you must still make a record of your selection. We recommend writing this down and concealing it until revealed. You can only use this stratagem once. I don't think this is particularly useful anymore. This used to be fun when you had things like um, To The Last or, you know, While We Stand, those those old secondaries where it was like, oh, has he picked it or not? You know, your opponent, because then your opponent has to try and decide, well, do I go in hard and try to kill those, you know, units or do I just ignore them? Like, if you've taken To The Last, they had to commit to killing them, otherwise you were going to score 15. Whereas these days, I think most of the scoring is kind of granular. Most of the scoring, you can sort of predict what your opponent's doing based on their actions anyway. So I don't really think this is that useful anymore. All right, next up we have Sabotaged Armory. Now this one is hilarious. Use this stratagem in any phase when an enemy vehicle model is destroyed. If there is any Alpha Legion units from your army on the battlefield, the opponent does not need to roll, that model explodes. It does so automatically. If that model is affected by a rule that says it never explodes, Ignore both that rule and this stratagem and roll to see if it explodes as normal. If the model has a wounds characteristic of 9 or less, it costs 1 CP. If it has a wounds characteristic of 10 to 19, it's 2 CP or any more, it's 3 CP. So this gets really expensive really fast if you're targeting big things like knights. That being said, it's so funny when your opponent has a knight in their army and you're just able to explode it and then just do D6 model wounds, so 2D6 model wounds to everything around. It's really, really powerful. So certain armies have really explosive units that you're going to get a lot of value out of this. And then there's also certain armies where they're going to have a lot of like characters and small units clustered around a vehicle. So blowing up that vehicle and then doing model wounds to all of those characters is quite powerful as well. So it's going to be niche, it's going to be situational, but it's going to be hilarious when you pull it off. All right, now this is another one of the reasons why I think Alpha Legion are going to absolutely dominate on the table. And this is one of the unique things that ties into what I was saying about how they have tricks for days. It's called Scrambled Coordinates. So it's 2 CP. Use this stratagem at the start of the reinforcement step of your opponent's movement phase. Select up to two Alpha Legion core units from your army that are on the battlefield. Until the end of the phase, enemy units that are set up on the battlefield as reinforcements cannot be set up within 12 inches of those selected units. So this is really, really good because it sort of gives you the access to infiltrators that the Space Marines have, but you don't have to use them. So for example, in the games where you're versing somebody who's not deep striking, you haven't spent points on infiltrators, you haven't invested command points in any of these abilities, it's fine, right? You're just playing your normal game. But when you go up against that Blood Angels player, you're like, ha ha ha, because you can put your cultists out in the front and if they try to deep strike on you, you can just go, cool, two CP, you can't deep strike on me. You can't deep strike and charge. And they're like, ugh. Oh, so what are they going to do? Deploy all their stuff on the table? If they deploy their stuff on the table, then you can measure out their charge range and you can stay outside of their charge range and mitigate their damage, which means they're going to have to move into the open and then you're going to be able to launch an attack on them. So really powerful against Blood Angels specifically, but anything like Sisters of Battle that are dropping in those units of Zephyrum and they're charging you with the Miracle Dice and they're automatically getting in, or if you go up against Empress Children and they're using Honor the Prince to come out of Drop Pods and do their charges or come out of Warp Strike and do their charges, or importantly, 
the upcoming Demons Codex, which we already know have some really interesting janky ways to get Deep Strike charges. So being able to just go, nope, I've got two units of cultists and they're just protecting my all my valuable stuff from your demons is going to be insanely powerful coming forward. So I actually suspect that in the, in the demons meta, Alpha Legion are going to be king. Alrighty guys, that rounds out the stratagems that are available to the Alpha Legion. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a quick look at some of the different uh, list ideas that you could conjure with the Alpha Legion. Alrighty guys, let's take everything that we just went through together and put it together in a list for some context. Now it's worth noting that I don't necessarily think that this list is going to top any majors or any GTs anytime soon, but I've designed this list with a few things in mind. One is the upcoming meta of Demons Deep Striking, Zephram Deep Striking, Blood Angels Deep Striking, all of these Deep Strike charges. So I've built it around that and I've also built it around going hard and trying to chase down that subvert secondary. So while I don't think that's going to be the most optimal play, I think it's going to be a lot more fun for the Alpha Legion players to engage with. And also, if you are able to master it, it's going to become insanely powerful. So I've wrote the list. If I was playing Alpha Legion and I was going to be chasing down that secondary, this is some of the stuff that I would do. So if you were to pivot and aim for different secondaries, you might take different units. But based on that secondary being part of the game plan, this is the list that I would run. So you've got Abbott on the Despoiler. You've got the standard suite of HQs. So you've got a Dark Apostle with Illusory Supplication, Mark of Slanesh, and Covert Control. Covert Control is going to let him make those Terminators objective secured, and Mark of Slanesh means that he's going to also have the ability to put Advance and Charge on units. You've got a Master in Possession, he's got Mark of Slanesh and the Liber Hereticus. He's going to be taking three Psychic Powers, he's going to have Pact of Flesh, Mutated Invigoration, and the Delightful Agonies. And then Liber Hereticus is going to let him cast all three. Then we have a Demon Prince, he has Wings, Sword, Mark of Zinch, Master of Diversion, and Warp Time. Now, what this Demon Prince is going to be able to do is cast Warp Time on a unit and then spend a CP to also do a Psychic Ritual. So that's a really powerful combo. And Mark of Zinch is just really strong in the way that it allows you to reduce the incoming damage of your first failed save to zero. Then in our troop slots, we have three units of 10 Chaos Cultists. They're great for your backfield, they're great for raising banners and scoring, those sorts of things. And they're also going to be really useful when it comes to spending the command point to make it so that your opponent cannot drop within 12 inches of them. Then we've got a unit of 10 Terminals with the Mark of Slash, the Black Rune of Damnation, and three Combi Melters. So these guys are going to be getting all the buffs from the Master in Possession and the Dark Apostle. And then Mark of Slash means they get the... Uh, Delightful Agonies, and then also the Dark Apostle is going to be able to give them advance and charge. Then we have five Chosen with the Mark of Slanesh and an Icon in the unit. They're also going to have access to Delightful Agonies. They're also going to have access to the advance and charge. So situationally, you can choose where you want to do it and what you want to do it on. Then we've got a unit of five Warp Talons, a unit of ten Raptors, again with the Mark of Slanesh for that advance and charge. And then we have three Obliterators rounding it out as well. So pre-game, we've spent one command point on Covert Control. We've spent one command point on the Liber Hereticus. We've spent one command point on Master of Diversion. And then we've spent another command point on the Black Rune of Damnation. So we've spent a total of four. All right, and the idea of this list is relatively simple. So it's leaning on those really powerful core things that you'll find in almost every Chaos list. So it's got Abaddon in it. It's got the big unit of 10 Slanesh Terminators with the Apostle and the Master of Executions in there, uh, Master of Possessions in there. So you've got that really solid anvil of a unit that's going to be pushing up the table, that's going to be doing massive damage, that's going to be objective secured, really, really strong. And then you've also got the Demon Prince who's going to be doing Warp Ritual, and he's also really good at like taking down enemy flyers and things like that, and also assassinating the characters mid-game when he's able to jump over your Terminator unit and assassinate things, so he's really powerful. Then we've backed this up with a few elements that I think are going to perform really well in an Alpha Legion list. So for example, the Obliterators. You can spend command points to make it so that your opponent can't target them. And now you can just walk your Obliterators out into the open and blast shit, and your opponent can't dig them out because they could, in order to get within 12 inches of your Obliterators, they're going to have to get through your Terminators, they're going to have to get past your Cultists, they're going to have to get past all your screens, they're going to have to deal with your Warp Talons and your Raptors, all of these sorts of things. So leveraging that ability to make them in, untargetable is going to be really cool. 
The other thing is you're gonna have a redeploy. So this is gonna actually allow you to redeploy your Terminators forward five inches because they get to make a normal move. Then in your movement phase, you can move them forward another five inches and then warp time them another five inches. Plus you can put an advance in there as well. So if you, if you want to, right? Uh, so these guys are fucking quick. Alpha Legion Terminators are fucking quick. And then what you can do is you can deploy them behind a ruin somewhere. So if your opponent goes first, they can't shoot you, they can't target you, they can't do anything. And then after you roll off, if you get the first turn, you go, cool, redeploying them right in the center and just pushing and going right up and taking that center. So that's really powerful. And then you're gonna be in the center, you're gonna be doing your warp ritual, you're gonna be doing all these really cool things with that Terminator unit. Meanwhile, your and your opponent's gonna put a lot of effort into killing those Terminators, they have to because they're so fast. Other legions like the Black Legion and the Iron Warriors, they have really, really powerful Terminators, but they're slow, they don't get that pre-game move and that makes them a lot slower and a lot easier to deal with. So your opponent's gonna try and kite them. They're gonna go, cool, you can have that, whatever. But they can't really do that with the Alpha Legion, which means they're gonna put effort into them, which means they're not gonna be putting effort into your other things. So you've got the Warp Talons and the Raptors, which are gonna be also taking the second pregame move. So one pregame move on your Terminators, the other one on your Warp Talons or your Raptors, and they're gonna be basically pregame moving into somewhere safe so that they can then in their first turn spring out and try to subvert an objective marker. And if you can try and so even if you can only subvert one objective marker and then the rest of the game, you're just subverting, you know, for three points, you're not actually doing it on an objective. But if you can flip one objective, you're gonna flip the game because you're gonna make it really hard for your opponent. So taking that unit that you can pregame move and then try and subvert turn one, meanwhile, throwing a brick of Terminators in their face that they then have to deal with is going to be really interesting because if they divert all of their attacks into killing those things and stopping you from subverting that objective, that means they didn't kill any of your Terminators because it's gonna take a lot to kill a unit of Warp Talents or Raptors that's hidden out of line of sight somewhere on an objective. So you're gonna be doing a lot of damage there because if they ignore you, you're then turn two sending those Terminators in and just mincing the fuck out of your opponent and your objective secured. So you're gonna be taking all of their objectives anyway. So I think that combo is gonna work really well with the Obliterators supporting and Abaddon going up the guts and just being a real pain in the ass and a real problem unit for them to deal with. So that's my idea of an Alpha Legion list. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Let me know if you've come up with any ideas for Alpha Legion. Let me know if you've had any success with them and uh, we'll get a bit of a dialogue going down in the comments below and yeah, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoy this video, please consider heading over to my Patreon and showing your support. You can sign up for only a dollar a month and it allows me to continue to produce content like this. I work a 45 hour week in a warehouse, so generating multiple videos a week is a huge tax. It's, it's a lot of work and it takes, these things take a long time to research and edit and record and all of those sorts of things. So all of your support goes a really long way to helping me convince my wife that I should be doing this instead of helping her with the domestic duties around the house. So trying to build a bit of a brand here, trying to build a bit of a, a you know, future business. And in order for that to work, I need your support on Patreon. So please head over there, chuck us a dollar a month. It's 25 cents a week, you won't even notice it, but it goes a huge way to supporting me and helping me out. So I do very much appreciate that. And uh, I'll talk to you guys after the next one. Cheers. Walk for the Blood God. Do your objective markers ever get lost behind terrain or other models and become difficult to see? Do they ever get bumped and accidentally moved during a game? And do they ever spark arguments about distances? Well, not anymore. Introducing the blog for the Blood God, not even remotely patented, neoprene objective markers. Made from the same material as astronaut suits, or maybe military equipment, or probably neither of those things, this two millimeter thick neoprene synthetic rubber is tear resistant, water resistant, and is designed to last. But that's not all, the blog for the Blood God not even remotely patented neoprene objective markers come in a variety of different designs and styles to suit any faction represented in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. These objective markers are a perfect gift for yourself or a friend 
and are a perfect way to flex and show your opponent that not only are you a smarter, cooler, and better 40k player than them, but you also have more disposable income than they do. For the low price of $25, you'll get not one, not two, but six neoprene objective markers, perfectly designed for 9th edition Warhammer 40k. But wait, there's more. For a limited time only, people who sign up on Patreon to support Blog for the Blood God as a Skull Champion tier $5 per month member will gain access to a custom design service where I will design a unique logo to support their gaming club like the one I did to the left here for the Potato Farmers local gaming club here in Melbourne. Follow the links in the description of this video to pick up your set today.